Um, so guys, I'm, I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, geospatial vocabulary of W3C, uh, very short. Um, I'm going to introduce it and then give an example where I am actually using it in my research. Um, so the motivation of uh, why do we need this vocabulary is to provide the semantic word community with a namespace for representing latitude and latitude and other information about spatially located things. Um, uh, to, uh, to represent a geospatial query information in the semantic web by extending Sparkle to query this kind of data. Uh, so we can query Sparkle using uh, uh, nearby or within. Nearby means, uh, for example, you want to search uh, in a radius of, uh, like, let's say, 100 meters, and so on. Uh, so the classes and the predicates of, uh, of this uh, vocabulary are a spatial thing, uh, which is a class of free uh, that represents anything with a spatial extent, the size, shape, or position. A point, uh, which is a class for representing a point, uh, given the latitude and longitude of it, uh, which is a subclass of a spatial thing in this vocabulary. And the location, which is the relation between a thing and where it is. The range of it is a special thing, and it's a sub-property of uh, the fourth, which is, I don't know who is going to represent uh, the fourth vocabulary. Yeah. So it actually uses uh, fourth to, uh, to, to relate to, uh, you know, to, uh, I'm going to give an example where actually we are connecting geo um, uh, vocabulary with, with fourth. Um, also, we have the latitude, longitude which are the decimal degrees uh, of each point um, and also altitude uh, of a special thing which has the domain also of a special thing so this is how it looks like we have a special thing and based near is where the relationship between this vocabulary and the fourth vocabulary is uh, so for example you can say uh, this point is based near some another point. Uh, so and a spatial thing has an attitude, longitude, um, and each thing you, it can point, you know, is, is of type location, which is a spatial thing in this vocabulary. Uh, so this is an example where we are using this uh, vocabulary, the geo, uh, WGS84 underscore quad. And then you define in your idea, for example, a person, and you say which is the title, and the, for example, the resource, the URL. And then this is the relationship between this um, and the and the fourth. Like fourth based near geo, this latitude and this longitude. And that's a way of using this vocabulary. This is an example where I'm using it for my location extraction research for hazard seas. Uh, we are interested actually in getting all location names uh, inside the bounding box uh, from, for example, DBPT. Uh, because we found that the gazettes <coughs> are not complete, so we have to find all possible location names in a, within, a, within a bounding box for, for our research. So, I'm just for abbreviation, I'm, I'm, but, but just for the presentation, I'm just putting these only. Uh, but I have, there are so many of them actually, alternate name and then there is old name and so on. So I want to get all of these names and, and they are optional actually. Not all of them are going to be there for a location name, but if it's there, I want to get it back. So if any tweet, for example, when I'm extracting those locations, if any tweet mentions any of these names, I should be able to retrieve that name. So this... Uh, uses this uh, this vocabulary, the geo vocabulary that we mentioned before. And these are the optional uh, that we are getting from DVPedia. And as, as you can see here, the subject, and then you have the geo latitude is that latitude that we are defining. And the geo longitude is the longitude of that location name. And then I'm filtering it out by this bounding box. If this longitude larger than this, Less, the longitude less than this, if it's la less than the latitude what is less numbers? than this point. Is this numbers? These numbers are longitude, uh, latitude of uh, the bonding box of Louisiana. 
so these, for example, we how we get uh, location names for uh, uh, all location names in Louisiana bounding box. So we draw a bounding box using these points, and then we are gonna get all location names within this bounding box. Because in in Wikipedia, you can see up in the right side of the page, you can see the coordinates of that location if it's a location, right? So we use this query based on this vocabulary to understand that this value is an actual longitude or a latitude. So this is how we define it and that's why we need this vocabulary. Because if, if we do not actually you know, you know, uh, define that this is a, a geo point, uh, you can't filter out using that point. Uh, what I mean by this is, uh, is exactly attaching the semantic to it. What is that value? Is it a decimal number? Is it just a raw number? Is it a geo point? Whatever, whatever it is. <coughs> and then this is the uh, result of this query when, uh, when using Sparkle. If you just copy and then paste you'll, in the Sparkle endpoint, you will get these location names. As you can see, not all of them have the other fields, but some do. For example, this. And that's the whole story of this. Based on what program. do you uh, get the coordinates for the box? For the box? Okay. Uh, based on what do you, uh, you know, set the dimension for the box and set okay. the coordinates? So you can use something like this, like this tool, for example, or you can find it in a, another dictionary somewhere, in Wikipedia or whatever. Like for example, you can, uh, if you want, like for example, the bounding box of Jordan, you just put it here, drag and drop. It says we define dimension, right? The tools define the dimension, right? Yeah, so these, yeah, so you just here and choose, for example, CSV raw, then you get these four bonding box, you know, points, which is actually the northeast, the northeast, and the southwest point, only these two points. So the lower left and the upper right points. Or you can search like something like this. Uh, Fairborn bonding box. You will find it somewhere. We usually go with this tool because, for example, uh, we know exactly where that, where that disaster is affecting. So we don't want to overgeneralize, like it's the whole state is affected by it. So why that's why we use this tool, and that's uh, why we need a vocabulary for such problems. And that's that's it. Any questions? Yeah, so for the founding box, do, do we have any other database that, that already is out for the founding box for all the countries? Yes, so for example, you will find Flickr has lots of them. Now you give this example, now I know that, for example, uh, when I was searching for a school in our location, uh, okay, so exactly like a similar box in a map, in a, in a Burger Creek, for example, box, mm -hmm. shows me that all the locations for this school, for example, in one box. So exactly yeah. similar to what I think yes. they yes. use and they give all zip codes to that yeah. box, so all links to that school. So I yeah, think yeah. similar job they do. Exactly. So if you ever use the Elasticsearch, uh, when you index your data, you have to use mappings which means like this field, I want it to be a geo point. It's exactly the same as linked to your data. You have to specify what is the value, what is this. So you can treat it 
in, in a way that is, uh, you know, uh, different than our integer or our double and so on. Even not only that, we, you've seen, for example, you're searching for rent or buying house or somewhere you want to live, so you want to live in Fairborn or you want to find somewhere else, you, if you go to Zilu or somewhere, so exactly this box shows our lo location in that particular area. So, for example, here in California, you can find the bonding box in Flickr. This is one of the things that you can see. The box will overlap, like the California. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, they overlap. So that's why uh, so, uh, sometimes bonding boxes are not a good idea. So you have to, uh, for example, prune them or, or, or use, uh, you know, Instead of, for example, Maybe they instead can, of like if they can this make is, a small, a small box together. And exactly. Yes. Yeah. So if, if this is uh, something that you want to calculate, then have one that is very bigger here, and then have smaller bonding boxes here. See, something like this. Any other questions? Classes are etiology, clinical features, diagnostic criteria, investigation, quality markers, treatment and management. And then So, uh, is there a description, a description here about the coverage of asthma, asthma or prospective asthma? Um, so, so, asthma is, you know, is a concept or disease may have many different perspectives. For example, uh, as in asthma is in uh, clinical care and for a doctor or asthma is in a public health issue. So there are, based on what uh, the perspective or the domain that you, you know, you, you, what do you call as a, either a domain of discourse or there's another term that is keeping my mind. Um, you would have a different scope. It, basically, you, you have choice of scopes. There can be many different scopes. And it's very important to establish the scope. 
you take any concept, they may, they, there often may be multiple scopes. It may be that, uh, you know, it is a perspective of a drug manufacturer. It may be perspective of clinician, it may be perspective of patient, it may be perspective of healthcare professional, epidemiologist. And so our aspect of asthma that they will describe is different. Is asthma being described only at high level because as among uh, because the idea is to discuss all power issues, or is the asthma is described for clinical care, or is asthma described for uh, you know is public health or other things? So is that something you are clear on that what what they wanted to do? I think it's uh, with a clinical perspective because when you see under treatment and management, you can browse through the medications. So, so tell me if there is inhaled corticosteroid that is mentioned. Yes, there is. Can you increase the form, please? That, that's corticosteroids, yes, sure. Hmm. Okay, uh, and... Uh, so there it is, respiratory use, corticosteroids. <coughs> And are the um, uh, are the asthma uh, management uh, issues of uh, mild and uh, severe, uh, you know, moderate? Are they consistent with the protocol that you have seen? At least the one that I had yes. in my slides. Okay. And what have you, what have they described? Let's say, what do they say about moderate asthma? Uh, I can see that they have put corticosteroid as a possible management for uh, the moderate. thing. I hope, by, by the way, uh, it's interesting, I, I know but no person, uh, and those fluticosone. Uh, it's interesting that the fluticosone there, because fluticosone is used to manage the, it's a, it's a nasal steroid uh, to manage the inflammation uh, from allergy or histamine uh, in your, you know, uh, in this upper part of the uh, thing, but I uh, didn't know that was a proper stomach. Uh, Okay. Uh, who this? So, okay, there's one mapping to only one other ontology. So we can map to many other ontologies to make it visible. So what would you do to uh, kind of complete this? We had a little discussion earlier on. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this case, what what might what might be the approach you might what what, you know, what approach you might take to make it more complete and to um, recognize it is complete or not? Or to, to to actually try and do a little bit more complete than what is now. But what would you do? But from there, where would you get that knowledge? to show them graphical thing and let them look at it and then they may say, oh, okay. More data we can get from family forums and all. That will get you. Here you are trying to develop ontology, so you need to be um, no, uh, like, you know, you need to have high quality information. That can be hearsay, that can be just uh, 
value judgment that the uh, patient might have, that doesn't mean that that is uh, in the cure. You can draw the relationships from the you know, known medical, uh, you know, well-known sources, and then we can uh, like uh, launch it like a beta stage, and you know, use statistics to weed out all the unnecessary. This is the problem. You guys are all thinking as a computer scientist. Very important. So, basically, there are, there are different things. Again, but if you if you are part in the critical, you know, interested in clinical, then you look at clinical <coughs> protocol. Um, you go to the in this particular case, you go to appropriate um, NIH institute. For example, for blood pressure, I would go to NHLBI, blood, you know, in the cardiovascular, and they have uh, you know guidelines, the, the panels or committees, and then they come with the guidelines, and that gives you uh, high quality community domain expert community validated knowledge. Same way here, uh, you go to there is a uh, drug uh, that there is a institute that focuses on uh, pulmonary disease and everything, and then there, there you'll find um, documents, basically the protocols that uh, physicians are supposed to follow. And uh, that is a very good start because that is well organized. There'll be some tables, and there'll be some particular numbers and ranges. So, for example, you have moderate um, um, asthma uh, and uh, they would qualify clinically what would you call what lab results you might have what excel nitric excite range you would uh, you know typically consider to be part of this thing and such so that is one place to start then beyond that you could go to medical journals and look at certain publications that are survey kind of broad analysis can and you can go from there. Uh, of, you can also go and check public website like WebMD and other things of that nature and look for um, literature, basic, basic information for consumer so the consumers are discovered by going to Mayo Clinic or other uh, institute of that kind. For the ontology that uh, Hussein uh, presented, uh, uh, one of my former PhDs, uh, Matt Perry, was the key coordinator. So he used to sit right where um, Mike uh, is sitting right there. He works at Oracle. So when there are these properties which you cannot actually figure it out what these properties stand for, that's the major out. Coming up this major shot coming up these ontology. Then they have just mapped. No, but really, really, what happens when you click? Nothing. Those, no, this is just a link, right? So, to something. Oh, has read to code. Okay. Stop they have some code like XS one, XS two, XYG, or maybe 66, XY. So, you don't know what. what that code stands for. There will be literals at that point of time. Yeah. Or, you know, they will probably give you syntax of how the data has to be represented there. Okay. Then this ontology is now to one more, which is ontology of drug neuropathy adverse events. Only, like, some of the medicines are being mapped. Suffer from the respiratory CTL virus, and that the patient also has the breathing 
of, of the blank node. So what is the blank node? The blank node is the axial metric oxide of glass, and the measurement is 50 ppm. And then we also, and then because you know sometimes a patient may have multiple infections at different times. Why is the measurement in parts per million? Because nitric oxide, nitric oxide measurement. This is the axial metric oxide measurement. So we also think that we can use the symptom property in when we sense the statement. So for example, the same patient suffers from the same virus infection but two times in different inter period intervals so that we can use symptom property to sense that. So the patient one suffered from respiratory syndrome virus and then the suffer from one is the symptom property of suffer from. And then for this symptom property, we have the start date. And then we have the end date. So same thing for the second event. We can also show that this is the another event, even though they are suffering from the same virus infection, because we have different start date and then we have the different symptom property. So this is how how we show that. And then we think that we can combine this topology with other data, for example, the weather data or for example the environmental data. So if the medical record shows that okay, this patient lives in Fairborn, and then we can link with the weather data of Fairborn. How is the temperature of the weather, the humidity, or the pollen index, and then we can extract those data to monitor the asthma in the patient's care. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So today we are going to talk about UMS, Unified Medical Language System. So, first of all, what is UMS? Has anyone heard what is UMS in the class? Can you give me explanation? So UMS is basically a medical language system for basically uh, which includes uh, different uh, terminologies related to some uh, diseases, uh, including health, and uh, they have the uh, it's basically a very uh, diverse and also it contains different uh, basically terms which are basically are uh, related to each other or they are they, uh, they might not be any relationship between these two so uh, UMLS has a very lot of basically table uh, tablet structure which in terms of relations and uh, it also uh, provides relationship between the two uh, diseases if it exists inside the UMLS and sometimes they don't have any relationship between the two and uh, they generally have uh, something known as a root diseases and they also have some sort of known as a subset of the diseases so there are multiple concepts and basically the entire UMLS structure has this thing as concepts and terms so you have different different concepts which are basically the meanings of the terms so that's the entire UMLS system okay. thank you for your comprehensive response <laughs> so Basically, if I want to make more, make it more generic, so it contains health and biomedical vocabularies, okay, which enables interoperability of between computer systems. So this fancy term, interoperability, you're gonna hear it if you want to stay in this noisy lab for a long time. So it's good to <laughs> have a good understanding what is the definition and what is exactly the concept of this term. So basically, if we want, if I want to categorize what is UMLS for, it has two main objectives. First, to effectively retrieve machine readable information. Can you share the slide or screen with them? They're not able to see the screen. So what should I do? Hang up. Screen. Here. 
basically the objective of UMLS is twofold. So first, it's going to effectively retrieve machine readable information. And what, why it is important? Because as we all know, the same concept can be expressed in different ways. In different ways. So it, it is going to associate the same concept into a specific category. This is the whole idea of why we need something like UMLS. So it's application, it has a variety of application, for example, electronic health record. Everyone know what is electronic health record? Because at the beginning I myself was very confused, very confused about, about what is what electronic is health record. I think you should think. It's not mine. Yeah. So, it has lots of applications when we want to analyze electronic health records or building classi classifier, dictionaries, and language tracks later. Basically, it links health information, medical terms, drug names, and billing codes. For example, as you can see in this example, Linking terms and code between your doctor, your pharmacy, and your insurance company. So it's going to have a unified language to, to connect these different concepted, concepts together. It has also other applications. For example, in search engine retrieval, or terminology research, or automated indexing, and thesaurus construction. So basically, UMLS contains three different resources. Metathesaurus, semantic network, and a specialist lexicon. Metathesaurus contains more than one million biomedical concepts from different sources, such as CPT, MESH, and LORIC. Semantic network which contains semantic type and semantic relationship between them. And a specialist lexicon, which contains information for performing natural language processing. So, how they create metathesaurus? So basically, they combine semantic network and lexicon, lexical tools, by first processing the terms and code in the lexicon and group the synonyms into a specific concepts and categorizing the concepts by using the semantic network and incorporate the relationship and attribute provided by the vocabulary and they release it in order to have a unified language. So now Monira is going to continue how we use UMLS in real world problems. Uh, we always have discussion how we can incorporate background knowledge uh, in other uh, approaches. For example, uh, here I present how we can use UMLS uh, and combine it with um, other approaches like uh, machine learning uh, approaches or uh, rule-based uh, approaches. Uh, here is a, an example of a research problem that we can use UMLS in it. So consider that we have uh, these two drug reviews and uh, we have, as you can see, we have uh, the mention of anxiety attacks in both two, in both uh, drug reviews. But uh, if you read the drug reviews uh, precisely, you will see that the anxiety attack in the first um, uh, drug review is disease symptom, while in the second it shows the adverse side effect. So we want to see whether background knowledge uh, is enough or whether we can use uh, only the classifica classification approach or not. So uh, if we go to the UMLS uh, uh, and see the concepts that it provides uh, for us, we can see that we have a disorder semantic type that it has some 
subcategories like acquired abnormality, disease or syndrome, and other uh, kind of uh, uh, subcategories. But uh, for example, for anxiety attack, it will uh, it will match to disease or syndrome. So we cannot uh, discriminate side effect as and symptoms. So we should another uh, we should uh, combine another approach to using only the uh, mapping the terms based on the UMLS background. So if uh, we go and uh, analyze our data manually, we can see that uh, there are some trigger terms, uh, some words that uh, can be used to see whether uh, one disease or syndrome, that uh, one uh, disorder that is mapped uh, before using the UMLS uh, is a symptom or side effect. So something like cure or cause or medication, these are shows. Uh, these are the trigger terms for symptoms, and we also have some for uh, side effects. Mm. Uh, it is uh, it is uh, the, the snapshot of uh, what the UMLS can do for us. Uh, we can use uh, many um, tools like MetaMap uh, to match the every word in our sentence to the medical <coughs> concepts using the UMLS. For example, MetaMap is one of that tool. So you, uh, as you can see in the drug review in the bottom, and all of the medical terms uh, has, match, uh, has assigned to one of the uh, syndromes. Mm, so after the collecting the drug reviews uh, and preparing the gold standard and uh, text segmentation and using something like MetaMap for mapping the medical concepts, uh, mapping the words to the medical concepts, then we should uh, use another approach. For example, we can use classification algorithm, and if we want to class uh, use the classification algorithm, then we should use both. Uh, medical uh, medical concepts that we have extracted using the, uh, for example, MetaMap, using the background knowledge of UMLS, and also other features to build a classifier, or we can also use the rule-based approach, uh, and uh, the rule-based approach that is using these trigger ter terms uh, and also the uh, medical concepts that we have extracted. Mm, for uh, so we use uh, one uh, available uh, background knowledge like what we have in the UMLS. We use the classification approach, and we also have uh, we can have uh, our own uh, terminology, our own lexicon that is uh, um, constructed for this uh, specific problem. And uh, so we can also uh, propose the rule-based approach that uh, it also uh, uses the both uh, our lexicon the U and the UMLS concepts. And finally, we should uh, compare and evaluate the results. Uh, the main uh, purpose of uh, my presentation was to see how we can use the background knowledge and also other approaches like uh, machine learning approach or Full-based approach to solve the real world problem. Uh, any question? Good job. Uh, hello, good afternoon, guys. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, a few details about WOOF. Its acronym is uh, Friend of a Friend, and it's basically uh, a machine readable ontology. You know what is ontology, right? A uh, description of, about uh, knowledge regarding. Uh, Specific domain. So I'm going to talk about FOF, vocabulary, example of FOF, creating your own FOF, types of FOF, its applications, and then conclusion. So basically, this is the logo for FOF, friend of a friend, and it's a machine readable ontology which describes about the persons, their relation, their relative activities, their relationships within the organization, groups, and people, objects, and so on. So anyone can create their own FOF basically, and uh, uh, it, it can be done without the need for any centralized uh, any centralized database. So uh, 
this is one of the 2005, I mean the popular ontology here, as you can see, proof is one of them. The, if this is uh, 2005, so it might have been updated. Uh, yeah, so one of the things that you'll find is that the fourth uh, is said no, um, that's totally far enough that as hardly any view, so currently it will not appear in 10 or 20 or anything like that, as far as I know. It is interesting to reflect why folk is not popular or being used. No, but the top, think about folk is a personal relationship and the schema of is a bit of a bit Totally different purpose. Yeah, so uh, four first started in 2000 by Libby Mayer and Dan Brickley. I refer to the link for uh, project.org, that's where the, it has been started. And it's the first uh, social semantic web application. Uh, it's a combination, I mean, it's a combination of RDF and our technology, as you know, it's a descriptive language. And it's uh, it's used in several blogging sites to encode basic user into FOF. And, uh, here, yeah, as you can see, there are many ontologies that can publish uh, social information other than FOF, like uh, SOIC. If you type in, uh, in Swoggle about the person, you can see many things. The first first link is about FOF, but you can see many uh, related things about that. And uh, the main idea, the main goal of this FOF is to uh, uh, link to get a linked info. Basically, FOF is a linked information system, and its uh, its goal also is to create a linked information linked information system about people, groups, organizations, and so on. So, uh, you, you can find, a, I mean, you can publish your own document, and uh, uh, regarding the fourth uh, document thing, if, uh, you can see, like, uh, people who are living in America or uh, Europe, and you can find their friends and so on. Uh, it can also use, like, other RDF, uh, RDF terms, I mean, uh, like uh, RSS, Music Prince, the Dublin Core, etc. And here is a four uh, vocabulary for you. Uh, the capital letters represent the classes, and the small letters are the properties, as you can see. So, uh -huh. um, as I have said, it's a, it's a basically a vocabulary expression, uh, RDF, Visual Description Framework, and all ontology. It's a, it has classes and uh, properties, and um, it is basically a collection of, uh, it's a dictionary of terms, which defines uh, both class and property. So, uh, TBL, Tim Berners-Lee has expressed, I mean, has said that I express my network in FOF and this is the start of a revolution in the FOF uh, thing. And as you can see, this is a classes, agent, document, person, project. And in RDF, you can write it as a FOF RDF type and it's a class. Uh, capital letters represent a class of things. And small letters represent the properties. Uh, so here is an example of both, and uh, here is an example uh, name of a, uh, which uh, the document is about Jack, fourth name, uh, his uh, link, uh, I mean his mail, uh, mail to Jack dot high, and um, his email address, his home page, which means that each can be described as uh, using an RDF, and he knows Barack Obama. Basically, it can be presented as here. I will give you a visualization of how the both can be like uh, RDF type of of Jack and his of name. His mail to address of here is his email address uh, like jack dot high and here is his name and he knows if of of knows knows this Barack Obama uh, like he is also RDF. Uh, And uh, for uh, Barack Obama has also his uh, mail address 
and his uh, 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 email ID. Sorry, not his email ID. His uh, home page. So basically, you can visualize this uh, this HTML format as like this, and uh, you can create your own fof using fofomatic, and there are also many other tools uh, which you which you can create like fof not and uh, exercise uh, fof and so on. You can create your own fof and save it uh, using fof.rdf, and you can keep it in the web pages, so on. As I have said, you can you can create many uh, you can have many I mean four tools and there are four formatic web view four not and you can see four not creates a, a description about a person and things and four explorer does the same in different context. And, uh, there are two types of four documents basically generic and strict. Basically, a four document uh, uh, the difference between the two is that. It has only one. Uh, it is an RDF document. It has a fourth namespace. It is serialized, which contains a subgraph. The difference between the two is that it defines only one and one person instance. Okay. So, how fourth application works? So basically, we need to discover the fourth instances, merge the instances, and linking people via fourths, fourth nodes with the help of fourth nodes applications. There is a pretty common use in this. That is a, there is a debate around the world uh, like uh, uh, assigning URIs to people and uh, should we do that and stuff like things and also that there are like trustable issues using FOF because we can uh, create a wrong information about the FOF documents and uh, fake information and stuff like that. Uh, that uh, that's a pretty common uh, FOF and with the we can merge both using named instances, inverse functional properties, all constraints and RDFC also. Inverse constraints is a property which uniquely identifies a resource. On encountering two resources, it's basically used for merging resources, all of these things. Merging is a, a very important thing in FOF. So coming to applications of FOF, uh, um, Pro FOF provides a very good uh, effective way to browse the network of FOF data. Uh, I mean, you can just link your FOF data and you can blog your whole site. And it has many potential in many areas like uh, painful registrations, not just a thing of past. You can just uh, give an indicator your location of your FOF description, throwing some relationships. And FOF can be used as an interchange format between social networking sites. Also, you can see like Amazon, in Amazon where uh, you can get uh, what you can say, preferences of uh, items and stuff like that using with the help of FOF. There are also many applications such as FOF not with the help of FOF they have like an SVG. SVG is a scalable vector graphic application that provides visualization of FOF nodes relationship as you have seen in a FOF nodes relationship. So that's it. Uh, a conclusion is that FOF is a very, as I've said, it's a decentralized, uh, without the help of a de decentralized centralized with a database it can work. Really? Uh, Gotten this from somewhere else? Or did yeah, you I have browsed like many sources, uh, like no. So, 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 so um, if I were to um, take some text from here, yes. like FOF is a library project exploring person centric metadata, yes. would that be exact match somewhere else? Uh, yeah, so person centric metadata, yes. Okay, you can't do this. Okay. I mean, I have created a difference system. Yeah, but you will have to put that in quotes. Okay, so I any text that is copied from anywhere else that is verbatim awesome. has to be copied. Okay. This is I, I told this on first day first day here. Okay, but I thought uh, if I keep it in last thing it's okay. No. Okay. So no. Uh, last word. Yes. For everyone. You can never ever cut and paste. And this has to be in the Quotes if you use that and put the quote, you put the citation right there. One, you can turn the button what one is. Okay. This is extremely critical. Never ever take that risk. It should never appear in your paper, not even in a draft that you send. Okay? So, FOF is a library project exploring the person centric metadata. Metadata is about uh, data about data and with the help of semantic web. There are many issues like FOFI is, uh, is, is not that good because many like Twitter and social networking sites like uh, Facebook have overshadowed FOF 
with the help of big data and uh, you know cloud computing technologies but it has to know its own users and we should hope that it becomes an asset to the other social in the future social networking sites in the future maybe yes two important comments yes first of all the kind of information you are providing is good in a way in the coverage is good but there are two potential big problems one is that i want to see exactly this presentation but with the quotes and thing like that i want to see how many words in your presentation are your own and how many are exact cut and paste if a lot of is cut and paste it's a problem this time it's okay but i never want to have that again because you all have to learn the way to read it internalize it and summarize it in your own words and of course when you can't do it or the original word is so well done this quotes Number two, um, I would uh, when you are done this current phase and uh, look at the uh, date when it was originally written. My suspicion is I can be wrong. But my sus- suspicion is that a lot of these things old, and uh, it's all there on the web, including the team minister's statement about hope. But in fact, it is that statement has come, you know, not to fruition. Right? The statement is is yes. not really panned out. nobody uses for any more that i know of so uh, and and um, i would like you to um, just so that you understand the creativity we need i want you to uh, present uh, you know very briefly uh, in the next class or to me directly why has for for not uh, you know grown as was anticipated so i want you know, people to ask these kind of questions not just See, one of the things that I don't like, you know, expect, I want in my classes is that you just go and present what is there. Much of you guys have done that, or less, you just present what it is there. Maybe you, nobody gave you, uh, uh, you know, instructions, and maybe it is okay. We still need to understand vocabulary and to be okay. But always uh, come up with something that is valuable, something where you are bringing new insights. that is not presented somewhere by waiting that's not exactly out there right you see you are you are the level when you are all of you guys are supposed to be doing research so that would mean that you need to learn go behind the scene go below the de- you know the you know in the depth and all that and not just hey this is this i'm just present that's not just the idea right but that there is no creativity there there is no contrib- additional value or contributions that you have that so think along that line what is it that you are saying that it is not already exists what value are you doing not just the sake of it but you really internalize it right 